Hello, welcome to the program. I'm Stan Grant and we're coming to you live from Sydney tonight and as you can probably hear from that clapping, I'm thrilled to welcome back our studio audience. <laughs> It hasn't, it hasn't been the same without you, and we're thrilled to have you back in the room. Now, joining me on the panel, director of the China Policy Centre, Yun Jiang, Nine News political editor, Chris Yulman, shadow minister for industry and innovation, Ed Husick, in Canberra, international relations expert, Lavina Lee, and in Melbourne, Victorian liberal senator, James Patterson. It's great to have all of them here. Hi. So, so this morning, the US and China surprised the world by announcing a joint declaration on combating climate change. Mm. This joint declaration came about through several secret meetings over the past few months. So therefore, my question is, does this joint declaration signify a fundamental change in the relationship between these two superpowers, who up to now have been fundamentally opposed in the areas of security, trade, and technology? Thank you for that, Praveen. Yun. No, I don't think it signifies a fundamental change in the relationship between the two great powers. It is a great sign that the two countries are able to cooperate on this global challenge that is climate change. But unfortunately, uh, with the global balance of power the way it is, the tension and the competition will still be there. However, I think it is, uh, I think uh, from Australia's perspective, it is great that we can see them cooperate. Lavina, is this a positive sign, though? You know, we've, it's been a bruising few years, hasn't it? You go back to the trade war, of course, between the US and China, and we've had um, tensions over the South China Sea, tensions over Taiwan, ramping up of language. Does this offer the, the, the slight opportunity here of some greater rapprochement? Uh, I'd hate to be a dampener on things before they've ever even begun. But you will. Um, <laughs> Uh, but I, I think at the moment um, it's it's more of symbolic symbolic value than it is um, in terms of substance. So there's very little detail there about what the deal involves. Um, now I also think that um, a key part of the U.S.-China competition is that it's a tech competition. And China views uh, emerging technologies in the environmental space as being part of that tech, tech cooperate competition. So I'm really um, struggling to see how um, they can both compete aggressively, but also cooperate on these emerging technologies. Mm. So I'm a, I'm a bit sceptical about where, what, where this is going to be, go. Chris, even though there's been a, a, a bit of a, a frosty period of relations and a lot of rhetoric, there's still been ongoing contact at a really senior level. And now with, with this, is that do you take away some sign of, of a, perhaps a bit of a shift here or is it too soon? I think it's too soon to tell, and might I say, that in 2014, Barack Obama and Xi Jinping signed something that sounded very, mm -hmm. very similar. Mm -hmm and we know what came after that. I was at COP26, I was at the G20. The thing that was the big story there wasn't Australia and France, it was the fact that China and Russia didn't go to either of those events. They sent their delegations, but their leadership did not go. There can be no solution to climate change without China being involved and the United States. Let's hope that that, there, that is the case. But I thought the most telling intervention at the G20 was by, by Sergei Lavrov, the foreign mm. minister from Russia, uh, when he was asked why they weren't signing up to 2050 by an Italian journalist. And he said, what's magic about this 2050 number? You cooked up this agenda at the G7 and served it to us at the G20. And that's not the way that we're going to play this particular game. I think that what we saw this time around was a disconnect of Russia and China from the world order as it stands, because they want to remake it, and, and perhaps rightly so, uh, in, in the image and likeness of something that suits them better. Mm. Well, I agree that uh, currently there's not enough substance to the pledge, but um, we can see that there is a domestic drive within China mm. to do more on climate change. It's not just about uh, looking good on the international stage. From China's perspective, its domestic messaging is that Climate, combating climate change and reducing emissions is necessary for the sustainability of the Chinese nation. So it goes back to what Xi Jinping has saying, saying about you know, the 
common prosperity about the future of the Chinese nation. So it's not just about looking good on the international stage, but a domestic drive. So on that, I think we can see more actions from China on climate change. J James Patterson, does this not at least from China's side say China is being recognised here by the US as a country of perhaps even equal standing that it needs to do a deal with to deal with something that both sides have recognised as an existential crisis? Well, Stan, when it comes to emissions, China is much more than an equal uh, to the United States because it is the world's largest emitter and, emitter and by some margin, and of course the United States is the second largest emitter. Uh, China has been increasing their emissions every year up until this year and will do so for a number of years yet. And if we are to have any hope in reducing global carbon emissions, it will require China to do so. So the Australian government certainly welcomes uh, this initiative, uh, but we're closely scrutinising how it's implemented in practice because at the end of the day, the planet pays on results, not on promises, and we have to very closely scrutinise that. Of yeah. course, let's not forget that China also has the biggest population. As it, well. it, and, and per capita, Ed, the US is still the biggest, a, a bigger emitter than China, and of course, historically, the US has been a bigger emitter than China. But what do you take away from, from this? Is it poten potentially more of a, of a breakthrough? Well, is two, there something to build two on? Two things. First, I, I can't let that comment go. The Morrison government that took a, pam a pamphlet to Glasgow is going to uh, look at the detail of what is in this deal when they're unable to put detail themselves about what they're doing in emissions, um, I think is laughable, first point. Second, uh, I, I think obviously people will want to test naturally what this agreement means, right? But there is a degree of significance about it. As you put in your question, a lot of this has been happening behind closed doors for some time. Uh, we know that America is taking this seriously and that they need to move on this. Um, we have... China has already announced in some of their BRI investments that, from what I, I understand, they won't fi uh, now finance uh, coal-fired power. But they've got a big job internally, as has been indicated. They've got a big job internally because they... And as James has said, their emissions are still looking to go one way and that's got to be dealt with. But what we have here... Let's not walk away from this. We have two of the big economies of the world, two of the big emitters of the world, who've managed to put aside their difference to try and make a difference, at least on climate change. So that's a start. But I agree we've got to see how this all mm. plays out. Hi. During the opium wars of the mid-19th century, Britain used its naval power to leverage trade and other concessions from China. Will the acquisition of nuclear-powered submarines with their longer range help or hinder our trade with China and the nations of the Asia-Pacific region, given that China is now a major naval power? Thanks for that question, Colin. Um, there's two parts to that, of course, and obviously we'll get to the submarines in just a minute, but, Yun, can we just go to this question of history and the opium wars? And we hear this a lot, and it's referenced a lot in China, and it relates to what we hear a lot about the hundred years of humiliation. Xi Jinping references the opium wars a lot. Why? Why does it still cast such a shadow? It is a fun, almost like a foundational myth of the country. It is, I guess, relates to a bit like similar to Anzacs in Australia. Um, it is cast on upon as a history that basically made the country. It, the Opium War is like a dividing line between modern China mm. and ancient China, Imperial China. Um, it cast uh, suddenly. China has thrown into the world. It, it has become bullied, according to uh, the, I guess the the, the the one history by the Chinese Communist Party. Ever since the Opium War, um, China has been subjected to uh, external coercions. Uh, Japan has also invaded China, and uh, there's an alliance of eight countries that basically has uh, raided China's uh, cities and took away its treasures. And that is to drum up, that sentiment is then being drummed up to increase, to inflame nationalism inside China. Now, nationalism is, of course, not only used by China either. You know, in a lot of countries, there's the victim discourse as well. And uh, we really should acknowledge that these things happen. For example, um, there's a dispute also between, historical dispute between Korea and Japan. Mm -hmm. And I think it's too simplistic for us to just say, get over it. Um, this is their foundational myth, just like we have our own myth. L Lavina, does this go some way to explaining why China appears to be so overly sensitive, some would say paranoid, 
um, the constant references to foreign interference or foreign domination, and why, when it comes to submarines, China has seen this as an aggressive, hostile act? Um, look, I think we always have to be careful um, with the Chinese Communist Party's rhetoric. I think just as, as many countries use nationalism for their own domestic uh, purposes, I think the Chinese Communist Party has also magnified this rhetoric of a century of humiliation um, to suggest that only the Communist Party can restore China to its, its natural place at the centre of Asia. Now, of course, there's a contradiction there as well in that their own narrative is all about being bullied by outside powers, yet its current behaviour is about bullying other smaller countries in its neighbourhood, including Australia. So, um, really, uh, there's, a, there's a real inconsistency there. And when it comes to the submarines, um, I'm not sure if I, I fully followed the, the question um, that was asked. Well, well the, 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 the question being that China has seen this as being an aggressive move. Indeed, Chinese state media, and uh, it's been reported in China that this makes Australia potentially a target as well. Right. I mean, look, I think, um, to be honest, I just think Australia is responding to China's previous behaviour. So since... Uh, uh, 2012, China's been building islands, militarising them. Uh, it's been bullying its uh, the other claimant states in the South China Sea, using coast guard, militia, um, stopping countries like Malaysia that have been extracting oil in its close um, territorial waters um, from actually continuing to do what it's they've done for for decades. Um, so actually, uh, the the countries in Asia are very wary of China. Um, I think the countries of Asia actually look at the AUKUS deal as something that supports a balance of power in the region, which they want. And if Australia can make itself more capable through submarines, um, then the Asian countries in Southeast Asia are actually supportive of that. If that magnifies our capabilities, if it magnif magnifies the capabilities of the United States, um, in order to provide a, a level of balance in the region. I think we should be a bit more careful with terminology here. Um, we're not really restoring the balance. We're maintaining the US supremacy in Asia. US currently has a supremacy in Asia, and it is challenged by China. It's true that it, China is ramping up defence spending, it is modernising its military, and that is what is happening. But for a lot of uh, from the perspective of a lot of countries in Asia, you, um, United States is not as a benign power as we see the United States. From a lot of countries, United States is also another bullying great power, just like China. In fact, China and United States both are bullying powers to them. So what they want to do is to ensure there is a balance and they do not get trampled on while they compete. And do you think they would prefer that balance that's being struck the other way? They would prefer China? Because certainly, why is India now so interested in the Quad? Why is Japan so interested in it? Why is Vietnam getting so close to Australia? It's because they fear the alternative. But Chris, isn't, isn't it also the case, though, that a lot of those countries play both sides of the fence. I mean, India is a member of the Shanghai Cooperation Organisation. It's a member of the BRICS countries, Brazil, Russia, India, China and South Africa. Um, yes, there are tensions, obviously, between India and China. Japan, with its historical tensions with China, still enjoys a better relationship with China today than Australia does. Can we really count those countries in if push comes to shove when they're pursuing their own interests as well? Well, all nations will pursue their own interests in the end and what the Australian government has been trying to do, and it may be doing it fitfully, it has recognised a threat and it is trying to deal with that threat at the moment. Everything that Australia has done has been to try and defend itself about what it sees as a perceived mm. threat, a real and perceived threat. And let's look at the ledger, because I keep trying to work out what it is exactly that Australia has done to so offend China that it would coerce us in such a way. They've occupied and militarised the South China Sea against pledges which they gave that they would not do that to Barack Obama, in fact, uh, on the lawns of the White House. They, they have engaged in foreign interference inside our borders. I spoke this week to some Uyghurs who are, who are frightened for their lives inside our borders. Now, imagine that. Imagine that there are citizens in Australia today who are concerned about what might happen to them, but even more so, what will happen to their families if they're seen to speak out. I've had the same conversations with people from Hong Kong. I'm sure you have as well. Mm. So there is a real and present danger. Australia is trying to respond to that danger. We are where we are because of the behaviour of China. 
And if China had just weaponised our apathy, they'd be doing a whole lot better now than they are. I live in Asia for about 18 years, uh, from Singapore to Hong Kong and even in Shanghai. When I repatriated back down under, I was so appalled at the um, um, marginalising of the Chinese here. Essentially, it's questioning our national pride uh, constantly. Now, most politicians say all the right same things, but their action often belies their voices. My question actually is directed at the two politicians on the panel. Mm. How will the two major political parties recover from the, um, uh, what I call, the erosion in trust by the 1.2 million Chinese Aussies? Mm -hmm. Steve, can I just ask you, you talk about the impact it's had on you and you've experienced this. What's been your experience? Uh, here in mm. Australia. Uh, do, you, do, we do, are... do you feel as if it's, there's been a, a, a palpable shift in this in recent times? It's very subtle, but it's very relentless. And i like to see some leadership from the politicians mm. there. Uh, uh, the example in that direction would be uh, for example, on the liberal side, the Senator Eric uh, uh, Alberts, um, mm. he um, questioned the Chinese Aussie. Well, ju just on that, the person in question is sitting next to me right now, Yun Jiang. Um, oh. <laughs> yeah. take, us, take us through that experience and just quickly explain what happened. So uh, there was a the parliamentary inquiry into uh, diaspora issues, and I put in a submission for that, um, emphasising the fact that there is an increasing suspicion of uh, Chinese Australians as well as generally Asian Australians in Australia due to the foreign interference debate. And I underscore the point that uh, we should not um, put a higher bar for Chinese Australians to express their loyalty than other Australians. Um, I was invited, very happily, I was invited to be at, uh, in front of the hearing. Um, and when I got there, I realised that they were not actually um, they were actually not interested in hearing what I wanted to say about uh, you know, the increasing suspicion of Chinese Australians. But what they want to know is whether I would denounce the Chinese Communist Party. And, How uh, did that make you feel? It was a very strange question. It came out of nowhere. I was very surprised. I was wondering whether the same questions was asked for everyone else was or it? was it just me? No, it was only asked to the three Chinese Australians that was there. And it was not asked okay. for it other people. James Patterson, how is that acceptable? Uh, Stan, I think that was an unfortunate episode because I don't think it was Eric Abetz's intention to suggest that Yun or any other China's Australian is anything other than a, a fully uh, welcome uh, participant in Australia's democracy and is that, fully is, entitled is, is, how, how to whatever though, views. You, did, did, did you feel as if you were being, your allegiance was being questioned? Definitely. Okay. Definitely. J James, well, Yun felt that way. Yeah, and, and I, I regret that. That is regrettable and it is counterproductive because it's vitally important that the 1.2 million uh, people of Chinese heritage in Australia feel fully part of Australia, part of our community, and of course they are. There's 200 years of migration from China to Australia and a great history of Chinese contribution to Australia. My own participation in these debates came out as part of a concern about the oppression that the Chinese diaspora in Australia faces from the Chinese Communist Party, and it is wrong and counterproductive productive for them to feel in any way excluded from Australian society. I just, well, sorry. So, I, I think we may, we may have lost your mic. Sorry, I keep interrupting you, Ed. I'm sorry, but I, right. I think we, we may have just lost your mic for a moment. We'll, we'll try okay. to fix that. Because I want and to come I'll, back and address and I'll, Exactly. I'll, I'll come straight back to you. But you've made the point, Chris, as well, about, and you mentioned it before, but you might want to expand on that, about the feeling among Chinese Australians that, um, A, they're being pressured, from China, but they're also being um, marginalised in Australia and made to feel as if their allegiance mm. is under question. Yeah, and look, and I can, I can understand how you feel only through the experience of one of the friends of mine, because I've been doing a lot of stuff on China since about 2015, or at least the Chinese Communist Party's interference in Australian politics is where <coughs> it, it began for me. Uh, and he raised with me the feelings that he had about that. And the problem that I have is, is that you can't stop talking about the fact that there is 
an issue with the Chinese Communist Party, and of course Australia being a multiracial democracy uh, should invite everyone to be welcome within it. The thing I would say though is no one oppresses more Chinese people than the Chinese Communist Party, and some of them inside our borders. So this is an issue, we have to address it. It's obviously extremely difficult. The interventions of people like Erica Betts are shameful and you know should be called out when they happen. But uh, we have to have the conversation. I don't know how we can avoid having the conversation. Do we have Ed's mic back? Is Ed's mic working again now? I think it's a plot, mate. OK, there you go, Ed. <laughs> and, 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 of course, in, in your electorate as well, in Western Sydney, it's a, a particularly multicultural electorate. Do you get a sense that people are feeling, as, as Steve said, marginalised and victimised? Well, as soon as you said that, my ears pricked up. I mean, as a son of migrants myself and parents who came out and, you know, they wanted their kids to fit in, do well, you know, be able to contribute, uh, the minute, like, it's very hard for people to understand what it feels like the minute your loyalty to your country that you have grown up in and you're trying to do the right thing in is questioned. So as soon as you said that, I instantly, I felt, I felt, or I knew exactly how that um, feels because I've had that myself. I, and I've had as well, I'm not saying this about, about James, I mean, we may have differences, but I've got, got regard for him, but there have been other Liberal politicians and ex-politicians who've tried to do that on the basis of faith. And, and for people that, when we've had tensions, mm. they've raised that. So it's not all Liberals, I might add, but there are some who want to play that game. And uh, it, it's just wrong. This is at a time where we need to bring people together and to work as one on one of the biggest... This is, for our generation, mm. what's happening in terms of vis-a-vis -vis China is one of the biggest foreign policy challenges our, our country faces. We don't need to be split inside. We need to be as one here and working with others in the region, secondly, as well. So well, I definitely feel that, that point. What do you think, Ed, contributes to this climate at the moment? Chris made the point that we still need to have the conversation. But if you look at the headlines now, and Paul Keating is being accused of being an apologist and Chairman Paul and whatever the headlines say, um, you've raised the point earlier that people who raise a dissenting view are now accused of being China apologists. Mm. And if you're Chinese, like Yun, you are then accused of being a Chinese agent, potentially, mm. as well. What's contributing to this moment and why are we seeing such a, a hardened us and them type of rhetoric and reporting around this? So I appreciate on the one level, as I said a few moments ago, this is like one of the toughest tests we face as a country. One. So in that environment, you can understand people, people have a choice that they can make to have a clear eye view about what we need to do as a nation and how we go about that and are we doing things that build alliances, bring people along on this or not? And for some people, they, they may misplace uh, that, the, the tension that is created out of that situation in that way that I think is completely unproductive. But we do need to recognise we're up against a different China now. We're not dealing with the China that a lot of previous, that, you know, previous generations of politicians had dealt with, particularly at that phase where uh, they wanted economic engagement, China wanted prosperity and wanted to do that well that way. Now China is much more aggressive and assertive on the world stage. That, that is putting challenges on us all. And the way we're going to get through this is to be clear on our national, national imperatives, uh, to also celebrate the value of the alliance that we have with the US and what that brings within the region, to work closer with people and, and our neighbours in the region, principally ASEAN, but also in terms of, uh, if you look at Indonesia, Singapore and others, working closer uh, within our region as well and bringing people together on that. That mindset drives... That will drive a mentality that will see less of the, mm. the targeting of people and more of the building of a coalition that we need as I said, to deal with one of the toughest challenges we face. Steve, um... I think also the way the debate is conducted is, True. shall I say, suboptimal. Um, you know, people talk about a Chinese influence uh, without distinguish between the country or the people. And then there's also talks about an invasion. All that is quite harmful. And, of course, the toxic toxicity around, you know, imputing people's intention based on their political view. You know, we're living a democracy I should have the right to um, criticise my government and should so should everyone here. 
And I should not be told that uh, because I criticize my government, therefore I am an agent of the foreign country. I think that's just uh, unacceptable. Steve, just, just quickly, just to Chris's point, do you believe that we can have this conversation without the feelings of people like yourself that you're being marginalised? Um, I think the, the jury's still out. I, I can't quite... Um, I can't feel it at the moment. I can't... Yeah. Well, we, we're certainly having the conversation here. We are. We are because we are in a, in a liberal democracy. Mm. Indeed. You understand. Yeah. Can, uh, Stan, may I just add, uh, with Ed's uh, comment there, right, I, I had a go at S Senator Eric Alberts, but also Labor just can't get away with it too. The, the saga of parachuting Christina Connelly into the seat of Fowler, you know, that, 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 that's not a good move uh, in favour against uh, a local Asian... I might just uh, get a quick, quick response to that from Ed. Well, we're talking about a liberal democracy and we can disagree. OK. <laughs> She's an immigrant too. Uh, <laughs> but so, well, the, well I mean, I think the broader... But if I can say, like, I, I've spoken very much in favour of Christine. I think she'll be a terrific candidate, right? I understand your point of view. But I think there's a bigger thing about diversity in Australian politics that needs to be tackled. It won't be sorted by one seat. This is going to need parties to deal with this, particularly major parties, okay. in a much more serious way. Uh, my question's a bit lighter uh, in relation to electric vehicles. Um, our Prime Minister, before the last election, came in pretty hard anti-pickup of electric vehicles in Australia. In the last couple of days, he's seemed to have backflipped and has uh, gone against his previous claims of ending the weekend, not towing a boat, and now he has decided that some sort of great technological advance has driven party room decisions to now pick up EVs and, and it's the way forward for Australia. Uh, I want James Patterson to please explain what's happened in the party room in the last 18, 19 months that's completely changed the thinking of the LNP. There's no longer a war on our weekend, apparently, James. <laughs> <laughs> well, in that uh, press conference in the Prime Minister was very critical of Bill Shorten's proposed policy, he also said that we don't discourage Australians from buying electric vehicles. In fact, if that's your choice, go ahead and do it. But what, what, but what we're going to lose our utes, I think, was one of the slogans mm -hmm. at the time. Well, I was just going to say, Stan, there have been some significant advances in electrical vehicle technology, and one of the most remarkable is that Ford in the United States is offering an electric-powered pickup uh, vehicle, which I don't think any people would have foreseen three or four years ago. Uh, prices have come down, ranges have become extended. Um, it is taking over, and that's a positive thing thing and I'm really excited about the future. Ed Hughes, you must be excited as well. I mean, you've been a great proponent of oh, I'm electric so cars. You must be very pleased. Been ended. You must be very oh, pleased that so Scott Morrison has taken the thing. pledge. I mean, he, on so many instances, Scott Morrison just plainly denies what he has said. I mean, and he made this point. He said the weekend would be ended by, by EVs, that, you know, wouldn't be able to tow your caravan and wouldn't be able to do all this. And, and the rest of the world just got on with it. And, and, and started working this. And we needed to attend to things like range anxiety and we needed... Would it, wouldn't it have been great to be able to manufacture EVs in Australia if we didn't chase out our car makers, if we got our act together on batteries um, and had found a way to create a new manufacturing opportunity that has now opened up because of the way that EVs are, are being uh, manufactured in different parts of the world and they find it easier now to have a devolved manufacturing model. Um, and we've had this massive U-turn, and, and, and the, I'll just end on this point. We have so many wasted fights and wasted years because the Coalition wants to extract political points on stuff that really makes no sense. We just get on with it. I don't know what to read into Chris Yulman's... <laughs> There's a little bit of applause there. I don't know what to read into Chris Yulman's facial expressions. No, no, no. Is, is you that, also I just had a new term... I just, just, term, just, term, term, just had a new term, range anxiety. Range anxiety. Yeah. <laughs> There's something else to get anxious about in the world. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's good. But here I am worrying about the wrong things. <laughs> exactly. Thanks again to our panel, Yuen Jung, Chris Yulman, Ed Husick, Lavina Lee and James Patterson. <laughs> and it's so... It's so good to hear clapping again in the room. So thank you to you, our audience as well, and uh, it's, it's good to have you back. Next week, David Spears will be with you live from Melbourne looking at the great resignation, apparently. Are Australian workers preparing to leave their jobs in droves as we embrace a post-pandemic 
work life. But there'd be some answers to that here. They're still talking under their breath. <laughs> Joining the panel, journalist George Megalogenis, health expert Jane Holton, Telstra CEO Andy Penn, founder of the Equality Institute, Emma Fulu, and musician and disability advocate Eliza Hull. If you'd like to join the audience, head to our website, abc.net.au slash quanda. We're going to continue the conversation <laughs> offset, I'm sure. Until then, stay safe and have a good night.